was 19, I contracted cancer. And it's interesting that you scratch your neck because that's exactly where I had cancer at. And so I wound up having to step off and deal with cancer. You know, um, I was because I was actually still a student in Santa Monica uh, Junior College playing on the basketball team there um, with my you know pro going pro, my aspirations to go pro. And uh, then hip hop, I was never going to give that up. And then I had to do stop and surgeries and chemotherapy and, you know, that slowed me down. And so, it, you know, I, I still stayed doing the hip hop. And I remember getting out of the hospital and start jumping in the van. We'd drive off and do a show and get on stage. You know, the show must go on. Do this fucking jump right back in the <laughs> fall out, come back. Oh, it was rough. But then I was so emotional. I wound up getting in everybody's nerves because they basically got it. I'm like, they got to cater to me. You know, and I'm, you know, it, you know, it, it was tough for us, and so I wound up having to step off from that group. Um, well, before, uh, I'm glad you made it through the cancer. So, congratulations on that. Hey, I made it twice because I actually came back later on. But yeah, thank you. But um, how did you guys? How and why did you do the overlapping waste? And what was your relationship with uh, Rodney on Joe Pooley? before, during, and how did that work? Okay, that comes way later or so. Okay, I'm perfect, segue. And so when I stepped off from uh, Bobby Jimmy, had to, you know, got, got well with the cancer and still got the love, you know, I had to lead a, set the basketball alone for I lost a ton of weight, you know. Um, yeah, a ton of weight. And so anyway, um, I remember getting back. And so I started, I, I put together a demo because I ne one thing a lot of folks don't, General Jeff never released a solo joint. No solo albums, no singles, no nothing. And it was like, damn, why did you know I had plenty of opportunities, more than enough time. Let me let me let you let y'all know. Just cause I ain't rapping don't mean I can't rap. <laughs> let me put that. Just because I ain't, ain't released nothing don't mean I can't. Oh, I'm still right down to this day. I'm I'm looking, I'm looking at some of you cat. Man, do you know Soren how it make me feel? I'm gonna just segue just a moment. I make me feel I'm standing there, I'm in the joint, and this cat's got records out and they they feeling they self anyway. And I'm looking at them like, man, your song is wag, your, your album's wagging, you got all this swag. You don't even like y'all don't even know how I'm so much better than y'all. This is so funny to me. It'll just be an internal joke with me. Like, y'all don't even know how nice this dude is right here, and y'all just walking by me like I'm nothing. It's hilarious. And then, you know, anyway, I just have to let that out there. But, you know, but I just held it in. I'm just behind the scenes, just whatever. But a lot of cats that those that know, know. But the majority of the cats, they don't even know because I, ne I, I never wanted to be out there like that. And again, as a student of the game, it, my first seat that planted on that was that, again, LA Times or whatever these, these, these articles were. And uh, it was like, you know, rap, rap will fade the, the length of, you know, in three years. They're like the average lifespan of a rapper is three, between three and five years. And that's like, Oh, I don't want to burn myself out. I, if I release something today, you know, three, oh, and this is in the eight, 84, 85. No, I'll be burnt out in 87. I'm, so I, I didn't want to never put nothing solo out there because my whole thing, rap is still growing. The foundation is still being, the money's not even in there where it's going to be. I already know where it's going. No, I'm not going to burn my name out now and then be a has-been, officially be a has-been by the time it gets good because my whole thing is, I'm so talented, you know, I can sing, I can produce, I can write, I can do all types of things. And y'all can't afford to pay me what I'm worth. These little old peanut contracts y'all giving out, oh, y'all can't get no nothing solo out of me. Wait till the, I'm gonna wait till the money get good and then I'm gonna do that. So anyway, so, so you know, but I, at this point in time, I, I'm finally getting my strength back, you know, hip hopping, going underground clubs, you know, just putting my ear right to the, to the speaker reggae clubs, all that. And so then I come up with a demo. I called Egypt. I don't even know how I got Egypt's number, but I called Egypt and said, Egypt, I, I got a demo together. I think it was maybe four songs, four or five, four or five songs. And I had a couple of uh, meetings with some uh, uh, record companies, small independent labels and production companies. And I'm like, let me, uh, you know, let me, uh, you know, get, you know, let somebody hear it before I walk up in there. So Egypt, I want you to hear my demo before I got these meetings set up, I, I need Joe, you know, cause I know he's got that expert ear and he's just going to keep it 100. That's the a, a ear that I trust. And okay, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Egypt called me in exactly 30 minutes later and was like, Hey man, you know, how to, you know how to play keyboards, right? Like, 
yeah, you know, I guess, yeah, melodies, but you know, I could find, but I'm not Beethoven. He said, yeah, you know, like, you know, my stuff. And of course, that's, that's exactly what I do. And so he's like, cool, man. Well, I just finished up an album. We get, I'm getting ready to go on tour in two weeks. And I need another keyboard player. If you down, man, I know you got your, these meetings set up, but, you know, I'm not telling you to, you know, put your, your life, your career on hold, but I need a keyboard player now. Would you, would you roll with us? And I'm like, me, let me see, my solo career, or going to it easy, my solo career. Yeah, I'll go, man. Yeah, with it. Okay, well, we got somebody to pick you up tomorrow, you know, 12 noon, you know, dry, you know, and Egypt lived out in Woodland Hills. It's a big, beautiful three-story joint. We were rehearsed there. So, so I'm in, so Egypt had, you know, his band. So I'm the keyboard, he had two keyboard guys. I'm this one guy, and on the other side was this young kid named Rodney O. I don't know this guy, but okay, he's from Riverside. Okay. And so we're playing, you know, Egypt stuff, the electronic, you know, Africa Bambada stuff. Okay, cool. That was great. So when we would take breaks, Rodney O would just, you know, we would hang out to the side. You know, he'd go, hey, what's up, man? Hey, what's up, man? We chilling. Because we was the two youngsters. Everybody else was older. And so, um, and I didn't realize Rodney O was, you know, so much younger than me. It's like, man, damn, looking back, that dude was a little kid. Like, you were supposed to have your little badass in school or something, man. What was you? I, I don't know. That was his journey, but he was a hustler. He knew what he wanted to do, and it's like, school is in the way. I already know what I want to do, and I, I love and respect that dude so much for having the passion and, and the clear vision at such an early age and, and went for it and, and was successful at it. It's amazing. I didn't know. I'm still one. Um, uh, do I want to play basketball? Do I want to pop lock? Do I want to, you know, do I want to rap? I don't know. But, um, and so he, so Rodney, you know, we went off to the side. And he was like, yeah, man, I just, I'm, you know, he had this solo joint, you know, uh, uh, he had just finished the, uh, uh, and it's your chance to rock. Go ahead, get busy. Mm, da, 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 da. So that was his first record that he produced by himself because Egypt produced the first one for him, whatever it was, I, I forget what it was. So anyway, he was like, no, I want to do some, uh, he told Egypt he wanted to do some, like some real hip hop. And I was like, yeah, that's what I'm into, real hip hop. So me and Rodney O hit it off right there because we want to do, we don't want to do the Planet Rock, electro style. We want to do some real, like hip hop, you know, because I've been to New York. I, I know what this is. And so um, he played me, he just came out of the studio and was like, yo, I'm finishing up this song in the studio right now, the one that I produce. Tell me what you think. And I'm like, oh, I mean, if it's whack, I'm going to, I don't, I, I'm going to keep, I keep it in 100 at all times. And he played it from, oh my God, what? That's you? Everlasting bass. It was just the instrumental then. Oh, but banana, oh, mind blown. And he was like, yeah, the, this homeboy, uh, Joe Cooley, y'all know Joe Cooley from Compton, the DJ from, yeah, man, he, not, yeah, he's gonna scratch on the rep. Oh, and then, you know, so they put, they put that up together. And then a couple of weeks later, so, we, you know, that I think it was just before that tour, what have you. So it got to a point where, I, you know, I'm performing with Egypt and then Egypt had, you know, his band. So Egypt had two sets that two ways that you that he would perform. It was either with the full band or it was just him with his background singers. So since I was dancing, Egypt had me in both. So sometimes I just so a lot of times it got to the point where for promoters, it was cheaper. They just want Egyptian lover. They don't need the full band, all the equipment, all that stuff. And so they were like, they just want the backups. And so it was four of us. I mean, Rap Magic, rest in peace, Razor Sharp. I, f I forget who else, who the fourth one was. But um, so we out there doing the dance. <laughs> you know, Egyptian lover. Yes, baby. And so then there were times when, you know, so Egypt had signed Rodney O. And Rodney O was, was his opening act. And so there was, so when, the, when uh, Everlasting Bass was about to drop, uh, Rodney and Joe would come on and they would be the opening act. And the show was just dry. It, 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 it just no energy. And Rodney, and I, I appreciate, I respect that about Rodney too. He knew it and he was like, I, we need a little bit more. And he was like, General Jeff, man, uh, if you don't mind, can you go hype up the crowd before, you know, just hype the crowd, blah, blah, blah. Sure, I, you know, sure. And so then I would go out there, hype the crowd up, not in the group, just hype the crowd up and, Bring out Joe Cooley, Joe Cooley, 
And then they'll come and bring Rodney on. He'll do, you know, Yvonne is on, and then Everlasting Bay, and, and then they bring on Egyptian Love. So then, you know, bam. But then it got to the point where, um, the uh, of course, Everlasting Bay started catching fire. And then Rodney was like, can you put, can you just be in the group? Like, can you just actually like perform with us? Because we need that energy. Like you hype the crowd up, Joe Scratch, then the energy leaves when you leave to stay on stage. And so, but then you can't be in the, the Egyptian lover, tight leather pants. Stuff. You got to be in some real hip hop stuff. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, give me a reason to get up out of these joints that I want to be in anyway. But it was for the, the Egyptian, you know, the lace and leather. Uh, oh, all right. But anyway, so I had to, add, you know, by then I was sponsored by Puma. You know, a lot of people talk about, uh, you know, Nipsey Hussle. Uh, our respect to my little homie. Matter of fact, I got the shirt on. You know what I'm saying? Rest in peace, homie. But, as you know, at the big deal with Puma, I'm the first rapper. I don't know, I don't know the West Coast, period. I don't know that was sponsored by Puma. 85 to 87. A lot of people don't know that. I even got the letter from Puma. Oh, thank you. Thank you, General Jeff, for whatever it is. So anyway, we'll get into that later. Um, so I had a gang of gear. They would just send me, send me catalogs. Yep, yep, yep. Size 13, yep, yep. This one, yeah. Oh, this color, that color, that just, yep, yep. And they, next I know UPS come, ding dong, and come in with boxes, big boxes. Like, oh. And uh, next, puma, 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 puma. So every day, every every hour on the hour, I could switch up to some new fresh puma. The socks, the, the shoes, the shirts, the t-shirts, the sweat suits. Are, so anyway. So, you know, Rodney was like switching to some hip hop gear. And so, of course, the general had Puma sweatsuit and it's, it's sneakers, bam. Yo, do the hip hop thing. Da, 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 da. Coming up next is the Egyptian lover. Now I had to run backstage, take all that off, pull on the tight leather. Oh, <sighs> oh, oh. <laughs> And that was fun. That was great because I'm back in the hip hop. We touring. This is great. But then Everlasting Bass completely blew up. And then it was like, okay, you're going to have to choose. Either you're going to tour with Egyptian Lover or you're going to tour with Rodney on Joe Cooley. And it was like, uh-oh, um, I'm, I'm loyal to Egypt. I'm a, I'm a loyal dude, but I want, I'm, I'm hip hop. <laughs> I'm not electro. Uh, you know, I, oh, and, I, and oh, um, sorry, Egypt. I'm going with Rodney on Joe Cooley. Sorry. And, you know, went over there. And then so that's when we made it official and I was the third, became the third member of the group. And I'll never forget. So I definitely got to tell this one. So. We had this meeting, and it was me and Rodney. Everything was me and Rodney. Joe, you know, because at that time, you know, Joe was doing his thing because he was popular. He was still the DJ Joe Cooley, and he's—I don't know—him and artists and they, man, they doing their thing. And so me and Rodney would always sit down, and talk, show, you know, Rodney, and he's younger than me, a student to the game, and his whole thing is how we gonna do, how we gonna get this thing out and blow this thing all the way up, and you know, be successful and have wonderful lives and be super successful and all that, and so. You know, Rodney would come over to my mama's house, we'd be right there in the front, front, front living room. And, you know, he was like, you know, we're just gonna add your name to the group. It's gonna be Rodney O, Joe Cooley, and General Jeff. And I'm like, no, nah, man, that sounds like a law firm. There's <laughs> too many names. Why? Well, then will somebody else come in, Rodney O, Joe Cooley, General Jeff, and, you know, someone DJ, so, you know, MC, so and so. No, no, just leave it at, and that was my decision. Leave it at Rodney O, Joe Because again, I'm still pres preserving my career and thinking about that three to five year, you know, oh, I'm going to fall out. You know, my career will be over three or four times. Like, hold on. Like, I can still be in the group. And then just like, you know, like Public Enemy, you know, Chuck D is Flavor Flav, Terminator X, Professor Griff, S1, you know who the individual, you know, Rolling Stones, you know, Mick Jagger, Keith Richard, you know who the Beatles, you know, uh, uh, Paul McCartney, John Lee, you know who the Ringo Starr, the George Harrison, you know. So I'm like, so if, if we're successful, folks are going to know who we are. They're going to know who I am. I'm not worried about that. So, I, but but just for the sake, of, it's already established now because of Everlasting Bass. It's Rodney O and Joe. Actually, when Everlasting Bass first came out, and I'm sure you know, but it was it was Rodney O featuring Joe Cooley. It wasn't even a group yet. It just it we were just piecing it together. And so, matter of fact, our first joint that we did, I think, was uh, Everlasting Bass, the remix. But it it never it never came out, and I did most of the production and. Because, you know, that was before digital and it was analog studio. And so when you literally had to punch the, the buttons and mute, bring in the vocals, bring in the turntables, you know, the mute, you turn the volume up. And I mean, there wasn't no flying faders. It wasn't no moving. And, and so, you know, so I was nice. With my, 
excuse me, my rhythms is <laughs> Ronnie, oh man, I'm a step back, General Jeff, that's all you. And I'm like literally just orchestrating the whole, oh man, but that was so much fun. But the first joint I think was uh, DJs and MCs, or it was this for the homies. Oh, I can't remember. But we had such a great run together, man. It just was amazing. And if people can listen to how amazing Everlasting Bass is, when you listen to like the, the intricacies, compare that to DJs and MCs, which is the same elements, except yeah. the high synthesizer part. You hear the same bass line, you know, uh, riding on like them very white bass lines with, you know, drum pattern. And then uh, Joe cutting and scratching on top, even the lyrics talking about Joe. Joe's as fast as Carl Lewis, you know. He said, and then on DJs and MCs, we just got to do that again. And, uh, but, but it's just, DJs and MCs sounded so much more mature. And then I got to give it up to Joe Cooley for this amazing scratch. Rodney Yo, chip, Rodney Yo, dig it, dig it, dig it, dig Rodney Yo, chip, Rodney Yo, dig it, dig it, dig it, dig Rodney Yo, chip, Rodney Yo, dip, 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 dip. Oh my God, that third scratch. Are you freaking, dip, 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 dip. Oh my God. I mean, it's under control on rhythm, on beat, and it's like, this dude is bananas. He's doing stuff then that cats ain't even doing now. All cats do is rub, dirt, dirt, dirt. I mean, but there's, it's just, this dude was in such control of the turntables. I've never seen that. And, and, and to be honest, Soren, Joe Cooley would do things like in the lab, like, or, or in the studio warming up, just like effing around, just whatever. And it's like, man, people don't even understand. I, he's done things that, and I think I'm intelligent and articulate. I can't even describe what I saw. Even here we are all these years later. It's like, bro, you have no, it's amazing. He'll warm up, just something simple. You know, it's time, it's time, it's time, it's time. It's, 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 it's. And all of a sudden, it's, 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 it's. And he'll go so freaking fast for so freaking long. Like, is this dude human? He's on some superhuman, like, this is not, and it's just me and him in the room to the point where I'm looking around, is anybody else seeing this? Like, this dude is a, what, what? And it's, 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 it's fashion. And, and then so much other stuff. There was, there were times we were working on like a song we did called Supercut, say yeah, boy. And you know, it was basically, we featuring a, uh, we featuring uh, Joe Cooley. Joe Cooley, give him a taste of how you rock the bass. Scratch the bass, boy. So he's scratching the real bass while he's bass, 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 the bigger, bigger bass. Dibber, dibber, dibber. We multi tracking. And so, but then there were times when he's warm, trying to find stuff. And, you know, oh, put some, rock the show, Joe, tell him you are the greatest. Yes, I am the greatest. So we knew that. Then there are other parts where it's just, you know, scratch, find some stuff. And he's digging in the crates. What about this? And nah, nah, nah. What about this? And so then he, oh yeah, and then he'll mess with something. And I'm like, hit record, like, oh. And I'm looking at the engineer, did you record that? That was fun, oh my God, that was great. No, I wasn't recording, what? And we just lost it to the, to the air. And it was like, I can't, even, I can't even describe, like dude in his prime, I, don't, I haven't heard him. Maybe he's still there, I don't know. Everybody say you lose it after a while, I haven't heard him. I'm pretty sure, I mean, he's still damn good. But in his prime, when I'm in the room, Man, this dude, hands down, I, I, he's done things I can't describe. And so, so when we look at, you know, when we talk about, you know, Bobby Jimmy with, uh, you know, We Like Ugly Women and Big Bud and uh, Roaches, and then to come over here with uh, uh, Rodney and Joe Cooley, and I did three albums with them as a group, you know, especially the first of you see, right, written, produced, and published by Rodney and Joe Cooley and General Jeff. We split everything three ways. I don't know, sidekick, no, I'm not the side, the hype man, you know, I'm a, oh, the other guy, <laughs> oh yeah. D and then some cats would be like, oh, that's Rodney Ojo Cooley. Oh, and he's the DJ. I'm DJ Joe, I'm not the D, what, it doesn't even make sense. It's Rodney O and DJ Joe Cooley, and I'm their DJ? Like, y'all don't even know, so we never probably, but the thing was, we never blew up big enough to where it really mattered. They just saw two names, two guys, that's it. Who's well, the other guy? Oh, that's the other guy. Oh, wow. So in, the, in, in some of my most famous records, you know, I'm the other guy. Great. But I'm behind the scenes. I'm extending my, the lifeline, lifeline of my, my name. So cool. But so now, so I'm, in, I'm all the way in Rodney and Joe, and we all over the world going to Brazil. And oh, I got a great story to tell you about Brazil. I may have to wait till next time. But oh, man, Brazil is bananas. I'll say this. I'll, I'll, I'll preview it like this. 
Brazil, when we, me, Roddy, and Joe Cody went to Brazil by ourselves. Um, yeah, they flew us out there. It's amazing. Um, that was the only, that was the one time in my life where I, I felt like we were like on, I was on some Michael Jackson. Like we were treated like royalty. And it was so amazing. Like just an entourage of like 50 plus people everywhere. It just like the city shut down like San pa Sao Paulo and uh, Rio. They shut it down when we came through. It was absolutely amazing. And I had to tell the details and uh, uh, so, I, I got to bounce, but uh, okay. we'll get to all that. We barely scratched the surface with General Jeff, man. So I got to uh, wait. Look, give me 30 seconds to finish this one last thing. All right. So so I'm with Rodney and Joe Cooley. And so then Bobby Jimmy calls me up. And he says he's got an idea to do a song called Overlapping Waste, which is a playoff off of Everlasting Bass. And he was like, you know, ask Rodney if it was cool. Rodney was like, hey, ta, whatever. He said, ah, that's funny, whatever. And so Russ Barr, uh, Bobby Jim says, well, will I produce it? Sure. And he said, oh, just to let you know, um, Dr. Dre's got the, the A. Don't worry about it. It's just a B-side joint. Dr. Dre's got the A-side. He's doing a song called Milkshake, which is a, a playoff of Prince. It's a housequake. And it was like, I got the B side. Like, man, I'm from the burn Dre, what you <laughs> but anyway, we'll get more into that later on. But I but that yeah, Russ Park called me and then I produced that. And so, but yeah, so even when you mentioned when I got writers credits, when I, man, I did so much more writing and producing that that my name was never on like, yo, know, man, it just man, I, but I still got golden platinum plaques on my walls. But it's so much stuff that people don't have no idea that we did. But we'll get more into that next time. Thanks for having me. General Jeff, man, that was amazing. I'm looking forward to part two, three, four, and five. <laughs> and, uh, thank you very much for unique access and for all you give in the game. And we'll be talking about a lot more of that coming up. That's what's up. Be sure to check out the history of gangster rap by Soren Baker. He's official. History of gangster rap features exclusive interviews with Ice T, Snoop Dogg, MC Ren, the DOC, and dozens of others. The history of gangster rap, a definitive look at how Los Angeles changed rap forever. In Los Angeles, the streets definitely set the tone of the hip hop music. I'm 19, I got a $50,000 car. My whole angle always was, I'll be street, but I will always tell you the horrors that go along with this life. There will be penalties and casualties for just wearing the wrong color in somebody's neighborhood. And once gangster rap made it from the streets to the TV, the genre exploded. What's that five on your TV basketball? Yo MTV it just catapulted us from being local heroes to national gangbang rappers. The history of gangster rap discusses it all from 1980 up till today. It's always gonna be shit happening in the streets. You know what I mean? So it's always going to be something to talk about. The history of gangster rap in stores now.